Welcome to Unmasking Humanity 21 Questions with Joshua T. Berglund. I'm your host, Joshua. Thank you so much for being here today. We are broadcasting on the World's Mayor Experience platform that you can find at joshuatberglund.com. And on this platform, you can find everything from movies to multiple different talk shows, uh, education on AI, media literacy, independent media, and so much more. And of course, there's an immersive reading platform. I think there's six or seven books up there now. Uh, six books and uh, six of the seven books that I've written uh, or co-written and it's it's actually a lot of fun. I really like the immersive reading platform so y'all should check it out. Plus, it's a much less expensive place to buy the books I've written. Anyway, we are all about supporting independent artists here. We are all about supporting the underserved. That is what I'm about. Um, I love creating win-win-wins with people. And if you're someone that's seeking to create win-win-wins for others, hit me up. Let's collaborate. If you're looking to be a guest on 21 Questions, I would love to have you. Of course, I don't say yes to everyone, but uh, feel free to uh, contact me on my website or the platform at joshuatberglund.com. Today, we have Gonzalo Gillian here today, and this is going to be really special. And here's why I say that. I normally would not have an executive recruiter um, regardless of how genius, brilliant, and successful, and how awesome they are. And Gonzalo is uh, very successful, and he does very well, and he covers major markets um, all over the country and all over Florida, especially. Uh, I think most of the locations he specializes in are in Florida, but he covers New York and Denver as well and some other areas. But that's not why I'm excited. I'm excited because I've gotten to talk to him, our guest, a few different times before the broadcast, which normally doesn't happen, of course, unless if I'm already friends with the person. But I didn't know. I didn't know Gonzalo. And, uh, but we've been talking back and forth for three, four days now, maybe even a week. And uh, just the man that he is, and just the, 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 even the people that he's connected me to already, like, uh, this guy's awesome. So these questions are challenging, fun, and unique, but they're also going to help us all get to know Gonzalo more. But I gotta tell you, um, he's a special dude, super interesting. And while I would never in my wildest dreams think I'd be doing a broadcast with an executive recruiter, uh, this is gonna be different and special. So you're in for a treat. So without further ado, please welcome Miami's own Gonzalo, Gonzalo Gillian to Unmasking Humanity, 21 Questions with Joshua T. Berglund. And we're back to Unmasking Humanity, 21 Questions with Joshua T. Berglund. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome my new friend, Gonzalo. Oh, I got to start over. My, <clears throat> Sorry about that. No, no problem. No problem. Take your time. Gonzalo Gillian. Gonzalo Gillian. Okay. Yes, sir. <clears throat> that I my mouth got. <laughs> if you want to sound even more American about it, you could say Gillian. It's okay too. <laughs> Gillian. No, I want to say it right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I am a respecter of heritage and culture. All oh, right. it's okay. Absolutely. And we're back to Unmasking Humanity, 21 Questions with Joshua T. Berglund. And today, I am so excited to introduce to you Gonzalo Gillian. Gonzalo, how are you doing today, man? I'm doing fantastic. Thank you for having me as well, too. It's an honor and a pleasure to be connected with you and to do this with you. I am so excited to get into these 21 questions with you. I was We were saying before I hit record, like, I love the energy. So it's already picked me up, and I'm excited. And I may have too much energy for the audience, but... <laughs> I love it. I'm going to pour it. I'm going to pour it into you. Um, yes, sir. So this is 21 questions. Before we, but before we get into that, I would love to know what are you grateful for today and why? I'm grateful to be able to be at the to be able not only be alive but also be an entrepreneur. Um, my story is I come from a broken home, and uh, I always grew up with even extended family members not telling me that I would never make it. You know. Uh, it even came to the point back in high school. I remember there was a test that we all took to see what profession we would we would be in. I had a friend that was an engineer, medical doctor, 
astronaut. You know what I got? Taxi driver. Uh, my GPA was low in high school as well, too. So I, I, I've always been like an underdog. So for me to have my own business, be a CEO and scale up the business as well has been such a blessing. Looking back at the journey that I had where nobody believed in me, but I believed in myself and most importantly, God believed in me as well, too. And that has carried me over. And I, I'm just excited for the future to keep scaling up and uh, and help others as well, too, along the way. I love that. That's great gratitude. I shared in the intro yeah. a little bit about some of the area that you cover. So to hear that part and your gratitude about where you've come from is pretty inspiring. So thank you for that. Yes, sir. All right. Absolutely. So are you ready for your 21 questions? Let's do it. Let's get it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Number one, what childhood experience first sparked your interest in connecting people with opportunities? To, so it, can it be more like a young adult teenage uh, era? Sure, so absolutely. Th the way I got into staffing is I had a friend of mine that worked at the airport pumping fuel for planes. He ended up getting a DUI. And as you know, or for the, anybody that doesn't know, if you work at the airport, it's very sensitive. So you can't have DUIs. You can't have criminal records. It's, it's harder to get into these jobs. So he ended up getting fired from American Airlines. And what I did is I was able to do his resume completely. Um, then I send out his resume to a couple companies, you know, just through not indeed, but at the time it was career builder. If you remember that in monster, <laughs> uh, back in the day. Right. And then we would, I would send out the resumes and then he would actually get interviews and I would actually dress him up. And then I would actually coach him on tell him, you know, Hey, this is what, this is your answer. This is what you got to do. You got to, you know, and I was able to print his resume and I told myself, wow, I, I can do this. Like if I'm able to do this for free and I very much enjoy, enjoy it maybe I should get paid for it. So that's how I kind of got introduced to staffing. And then within that same period of time, my mom wanted to change hospitals. So again, I did her resume. I coached her on a couple of things. So I started to really like it. So um, I, I, grew, I, I went to school at Barry University. I got my marketing degree. I got my MBA in finance, but uh, I never, I've always looked into maybe getting into staffing some way, somehow there was always interest there. And I, I did a lot of odd jobs after college that let, that basically added value to, to that in, in tactics that I use today within my sales and recruitment process. So I guess God has a way of, you don't understand it at the time on the present time, but then you look back and you say, oh, that's why I did that odd job for six months, you know, but I learned something from it. So that, but that's what got me into, into, into the staffing world. And, uh, you know, I've been doing it 12 years. I thought that I would leave it after three or four years, but nope, I'm still here. <laughs> so, yeah. That is so funny because I, I was just thinking about the time that I, I had a similar situation. Am I going, I, cause I, I wasn't connecting the dots at the time to all of these different things I was doing not realizing it was connecting the dots to a puzzle and yeah. it took me i was party staffing you know those party staffing companies that's what yeah. i was doing in between acting jobs and all that and and it took me like after i left that to actually see oh that was the purpose for that because of all the things that i was learning while i was there i mean essentially i had been i had, I had done event producing before but to the level of detail that I was able to put on events, most of that work came from party staffing, <laughs> a minimum wage job, barely making any money at all. But most of the lessons and the skills I learned for event production happened through that. And then, of course, packaging it together later with my media knowledge and what I do in media, it was like, oh, my gosh, this entire time, even yeah. my healthcare experience at the time like seeing how that's played into what I do now. Like God it's wastes crazy. nothing. It's amazing yeah. how that works. So beautiful yeah. first, beautiful first answer. Absolutely, question, absolutely. <laughs> question two, how has your multicultural background shaped your approach to leadership and communication? Great question. I being multicultural and being exposed. So my dad is uh, Mexican Brazilian. My mom is Colombian. So I grew up in a household where I would answer to him in Portuguese, and then I would answer to my mom in Spanish. And then when we migrated to this country, then I brought in the English coming along the way. So it's helped me a lot because uh, being multicultural has made me realize that people have various different habits. 
And so what I try to do is I try to understand them just based on their background. And I'll give you an example. Like, uh, for instance, I'll give you Colombia as a, as a great example. Where my family's from, Barranquilla, Cartagena, if you're very familiar, it, that's the coastal side of Colombia. So if you have a meeting with anybody from that region, usually if it's, let's just say the meeting's at 2 p.m., in reality for them, it's going to be 3 to 3.30, all right? Or, or if there's a party, your birthday party, and you're inviting them at 7 p.m., expect them between 8.30 to 8.45, you know? Um, and that's the culture, and that's just the way it is. And that's If you deal with anybody in the Caribbean, usually, I mean, uh, it, it, business-wise, it, the, the higher level, they tend to be better. But, yeah, I mean, expect a little bit of a delay. So... Uh, because of that, I've gotten less frustrated. I, I get to understand people a little bit more. And and lately, as I've gotten older, I've, I've been able to just try to see, put my, myself in their shoes, see their perspective on things. And that way I understand it. I have to give people grace, you know, and that's the other thing I'm learning as well. But uh, just being multicultural has really, really helped out not only uh, understanding people, but connecting with people as well and understanding languages. So what I do, because I speak a little bit of Greek, a little bit of Arabic, what I try to do now is I try to uh, hear a word and then I try to break it down and see its origin from that word as well, too. So I try to be very uh, methodical as and hear what people what words people are using. And that way I can tell how educated they are. You know, I try to really psychoanalyze people a lot as I've gotten older and it's and it's worked to my advantage in many ways because then my approach changes. It's still authentic, but it changes a little bit on, and, you know, based on who I'm dealing with. I would like that answer. That's good. Um, can that. you can you share a moment of failure that ultimately led to significant personal or professional growth? <laughs> I mean, f failure has been my best friend. I feel like I, I didn't understand this concept, but the, the, the failure actually leads to success. So uh, remember I had told you earlier, people have always told me like I wasn't going to make it or anything like that. Um, you know, I had a very bad GPA and so forth. But then I guess recent experience that I had was in, in, in the business world and, and very recent last year, Q4 was just very bad for business. You know, we didn't get enough business. Um, and and you know we 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 had cash flow but we also have employees we have to pay them but there was no revenue coming in and for the first time in in years i i didn't pay myself for three months you know i had to rely on my reserves as well too i i definitely put my employees first or my, well my business partners i like to call them my business partners and uh so but i've learned a lot through that uh, and I've, I've learned a valuable lesson as well too in terms of you know keeping expenses even lower you know especially throughout various different times um as well and I, that will never happen to me ever again that situation even if we don't bill for the next three or four months i know what to do now as well so what i've learned is failure god has set me up to fail uh in my life but it has been such a blessing the way i i, I tackle things now i don't panic which is great i don't stress either I don't know if you ever read uh, Marcus Aurelius or Seneca, those guys that founded Stoicism, but they, they like to live in the present and they like to analyze and meditate and see how they can uh, provide solutions to their problem. You know, and uh, I've been able to embrace that and tackle it. And, and it has been a blessing. So the main thing is to not panic. I've noticed, you know, because growing up, I've panicked a lot. I stressed a lot and never led me to anything, you know, so uh, that has been a blessing within itself. I love that. Perfect. In your experience, what's the most misunderstood aspect of the recruiting industry? That we are uh, just telemarketers, uh, and 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 you know, and and we make very little money. If you're very good at what you do, you you can do very very well. You can have the salary of a doctor, a surgeon, definitely a lawyer, a high level lawyer as well. Uh, but I do feel that sometimes because it's such a saturated industry. And lately, the last couple of years, it's been harder to find good quality people in all industries. I'm sure you know about that as well, too. And that also includes the recruitment sector. Nobody wants to work hard anymore. There's cold calling involved. There's relationship building. There's connections. The staffing industry has two sides. It's B2B and B2C. B2B is on the business side, right? Getting clients. B2C would be the customers or in this case, candidates, right? So there's two different mindsets that you got to have and put them together. But you have to work it like nothing comes to you. And because there's a harder, it's harder to find quality people. Uh, staffing agencies have been hiring anybody that is even went to willing to even take a shot 
And that lowers the quality as well, too. So the last couple of years has been a little tough. Recruiters get looked at like telemarketers. And, and, and we're definitely not the right people. Understand business, understand the industry, and can understand you and connect you with the right, uh, with the right companies, uh, I feel. Yeah, I like that you said that. One of the things <laughs> that I, I think is, and I'd like your, this is not a question or planned sure. question, but I'm going to add it anyway. Um, we have like, one of the greatest injustices, I think, for employees is that they've been taught to be specialize and, mm -hmm. or, and, you know, we've told, and even with media, like you niche out, you niche out and it's caused people, you play one sport and excel at it. You know, that, that there's that kind of advice sure. and really the world that we're going into, you're better off being a generalist, knowing how yes. to do multiple things because, which is going to segue into the next question, but there's too many people that have been focused on one thing. Like you can't just be an actor anymore. You can't just be a producer. <laughs> you just you can't just be a writer. Like you have to do all of it. Now, the flip side is, and again, we're gonna segue into the question, but the flip side is we have all of these tools available to us now to take advantage of these things, but we have to sh break out of this, this thinking of being a specialist at one thing because I don't believe the world welcomes that anymore. Yeah. Am I wrong? No, you're you're 100 right. Unless you're like a brain surgeon, I oh, yeah, want you to specialize yeah, yeah. on. I you're want right. you to specialize on that. You know what I mean? I don't Please want you do, to be yeah. a podcaster or anything. Although there's some that are actually, but uh, no, you're 100 <laughs> right. You know what? And 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 to your point, I always tell, especially now with hard economic times and people getting laid off, the first advice that I give to them uh, is learn a new trade. You know, if, if you don't know Excel, if you're an accountant and you've never really truly learned Excel, guess what? Use this time to add more value, Power BI or whatever systems that are out there for the industry or what you're trying to do. So I, I definitely agree with you. Being in the employment market, I've noticed that the people that get paid even more, why do C level people get paid 200, 300, 400, 500,000? It's because like a CEO, COO, they understand they're generalists. They understand an operation. It's not, they understand sales, they understand marketing, they understand accounting, they understand various different facets of an operation. And to your point, you're right. The more you get to know, the better it is. You're going to be more valuable in the market than just knowing that one specific thing. And that's the mentality that we've been conditioned in. That's the whole nine to five. That's the whole, you know, you just listen to your boss, you watch your clock, 5 p.m., you leave. <laughs> and, and you know, that's that that mentality is connected with like, hey, you should just stick to this one thing. And it's very boring in a world where there's so much to do, so much to learn. And I do feel that every individual, I don't care who you are, you can add a lot of value to this world. This is why God made you. And uh, I think that's very important that you you put yourself out there um, to whatever capacity that you can and, and add value to society as much as you can, you know, in my opinion. But you're right. I agree with you. I, well, let me ask a question because I could get stuck in this conversation for an hour. <laughs> I, I, I love this conversation, but... It's not a Same. conversational show. All right, next question. How do you balance the human element of recruitment with the increasing role of AI and technology? Great question. So with AI and technology at the current... <laughs> Come back. No, you. I think he accidentally deleted himself. There he is. I lost you. I lost you. So... <laughs> Welcome back. So, I'm not going to edit this out, by the way. <laughs> no. Hey, hey we, we, we need to just keep it authentic, right? In my opinion, I like it. So so with, with AI so far, I've seen it impact, but I've seen it impacted and in, in it's making my business easier, you know, in terms of searches and in terms of streamlining a lot of things. But I, what I have noticed is, and I don't know if this has happened to you, but have you ever contacted like tri a travel advisor and then there's like a little chat box and it's not an authentic person. It's like an AI feature yeah. kind of replying back to you. Well, transition that over into my industry. That's where we are still are as well, too. So it's not AI hasn't been super perfected yet where we're having AI kind of talk to candidates or anything like that. We're not there yet, but definitely AI has helped us. And it's probably hopefully helping employees as employees looking for work with just streamlining the kind of jobs that they're looking for as well, because a lot of the times these indeed or career builder back in the day or LinkedIn, they work off SEO, search engine optimization. So the more 
for anybody that's looking for a job right now, make sure that you uh, chat GPT, which is an AI tool. What are the key words that employers look for on a resume like yours with your experience? And make sure that you add those keywords as constantly and as consistent and strategically as possible on your resume. Because once you implement that resume to Indeed or LinkedIn, and who's ever searching for an engineer or whatever the case may be, you'll be one of the first ones that they'll be looking for uh, that, that will pop out in, in, into their searches. So AI so far, the way I've seen it, has been much more of an assistance than a hindrance in my industry at the current moment. It's a fast paced world. Maybe we talk a year from now and I'm gonna tell you how much, how crappy it is and how it's making my life miserable. I don't know yet, but we'll find out. Boy, I have so much to add to that. Ah, <laughs> ah, my, uh, As you question. should. <laughs> I, I know, but I'll, I'll break out of the format of the show and I don't wanna be in a conversation for four hours on this. Okay, I am gonna add this. The AI tools that are available, this is another problem that I see happening in my world, is that people think that AI is either God or will be God, or they think it's going <laughs> to fix everything, or they're afraid of it. And really, the truth is in the middle. I mean, at least for now, because it could change wildly. If, AG, yeah. when, if, if AI becomes sentient, then we've got all kinds of other things to talk about. <laughs> but one of the, the problem is, though, is that a lot of these people that I see with trying to sell the courses, they're selling prompting, they're, it's all AI focused or VR focused. Or, But the problem is all of those things are just a tool and it's a trap to go all in on any of it. And the reason why is because going back to the question, like a, a question or two ago, is that these, you hyper-focus on that skill and what happens is you become dependent on that AI. And then in doing so, you start losing right. your creativity and you start losing the bigger picture because the trick is for all of us, no matter if you're employed now, unemployed, or you're somebody that sees the opportunity of, well, we have all of these media tools available. So now what I can do is use my gifts, talents, and intellectual property to create multiple revenue streams and I can go in business for myself. If you use AI properly, you can take advantage of that. But if you look at to AI as the only way, and this is all you're learning, you're missing the bigger picture. Every single person, and I'm going to stand on this statement because I've been saying it for eight years and I'm going to do it right now in front of a, an executive recruiter. Every single person that's watching this right now needs to become media literate. Not media literate in this, well, media literate in the sense of knowing how to determine if something's fake news or not. If it's a fake story, if it's AI, it's an AI video because there's a bunch of fake videos out right now. Yeah, and with AI fakes. generating content, that's going to be a problem. That's one phase of media literacy. The other phase of media literacy is the education in how to publish a book, how to create video content, how to publish it, how to monetize it, how to create a podcast, how to take advantage of blogs, literally learning every single media outlet, including VR including AGI, including, I mean, I could go on and on and on, but yeah. having that knowledge base, and it can be generalist knowledge, but that generalist knowledge will at the very least expand your mind to see, oh my gosh, I can monetize this. I can monetize that. I can do this. I don't need a job. And I'm not trying to take away from your business, but no, even couldn't. employees, even, even companies that start to operate as a media first organization will be set up for success because one, the revenue streams, but the other part is that it positions the hierarchy of that company to elevate the whole company by them acting as media personalities. Now, yeah. of course, if it's a company, the, the CEO has like, or the president or the chairman, they can say, okay, well, obviously I'm not gonna let you talk about anything you want. You can have some control. But if companies start thinking like TV networks, they will start setting themselves up for success. And the main reason why is the revenue streams, but also everyone will be media in the fourth industrial revolution. Media won't be a big deal. Notice how saying I have a podcast means nothing anymore. Oh, yeah. I have a TV show. Well, so does my dog. My yeah. dog has it. Like, we don't need that. So Media literacy is a very important tool, and I'm not trying to take away your shine or anything right now, but this is essential for all of us. 
or we will be left behind in an America. America specifically is further behind when it comes to media literacy education than 100%. any country on the planet. And it's terrifying yeah. to me. So my rant's over. I apologize. No, no, no. But it, it's what you were saying back to your previous point, you know, being a generalist, right? As an employee, I think you have to be a generalist as well, too, in today's world and how we're heading into things as well. You know who does a good job doing that? As you were talking, I was thinking I have a mentor of mine, Patrick Bat David. Uh, you may know him, oh. Valuetainment. Well, yeah. that's what he does. A lot of his employees are, are media personalities as well, too. He has Bat David Consulting and he has Valuetainment, but he mixes both of them. So if you ever see the salespeople at Bet David Consulting, they all have their little podcast or they all have uh, an Instagram and they have videos and it's consistent content as well. So he's one of those guys that's definitely scaling up and actually, you know who he is, right? And he's doing oh, yeah. it the right way. I, no, I, I love him. And I, I mean, look, Good I'm guy. Not, I don't necessarily, <laughs> I'm not into that type of sales, but what he's doing is the exact model I'm talking to you about. But do yes. you know where he learned it? Where did he learn it from? He learned it from the World Economic Forum in the United Nations, the same place I go. did many, many years ago. When I first there started studying, I started paying attention to Agenda 21 when I first heard about it. And again, it was in this conspiracy world, but I thought that actually kind of makes sense to me. I'm going to pay attention and see if this happens. Sure enough, Agenda 21 it played out. So when Agenda 2030 and Agenda 2045 came out to read about, I'm like, well, I'm definitely going to pay attention to this. So literally, there's a document from the World Economic Forum. It's the future of media and entertainment. Mm. It's a study. It's like it, it's long, but it's worth reading. It gives the blueprint of the future of business in that document. So all the information has been out there for years, but it's been widely ignored by most because what do we do? People go to the news. They go to social media. They don't actually sit and listen to what the world leaders are saying about what we need to be doing. And that is a gross, gross no, not a gross wow. injustice, but it's really, really scary because yeah, we're, we're being attention to the wrong voices. Wow. Yeah, so yeah, what yeah. he's doing is the model specifically. So he does a great job. He's the perfect Makes example. Sense. So that was a great, great, great. Feedback. Yeah, I thought about him because I saw him at church on Sunday as well. And I'm like, man, you know, who, who does that? He, he does, he does that, you know, so interesting. He does a great, I, I really do. He's a good personality, value entertainment. That's the other thing too, that he's nailed is that the future, celebrities of the future are going to be artists, thought leaders, and educators. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'm seeing because, it. Because our task is to teach the younger generation to build the new world that we wanted to see. In other words, like you and I, we've learned from the mistakes of our ancestors, of our past, Yes. We're going through our healing journeys, gone through our healing journeys. We've done that. So now the lessons that we've learned, we get to pass on. So that's why we will be, now that will change in some time, but this is that is one example of why value entertainment, edumatainment, <laughs> why that is going to bring in the new era of celebrity. And it's oh, going yeah. to be the right yeah. reasons. No, and you should see the events that he does. It's thousands and thousands of people that are very like-minded. They're like me, almost. You know, it's like when you talk to somebody from there, it's like you're talking to yourself. It's 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 incredible. It's incredible. But yeah, you're right. And thought leaders are definitely something that you have seen the last couple of years, and I, I don't see it stopping. It's going to continue to grow. So great point. For sure, for sure. Yeah, and I love that you brought up the example because <laughs> it's just the perfect one. All right, next question. Yeah. Wait. Okay, here we go. What's the most challenging ethical dilemma you faced in your career and how did you navigate it? Uh, you you definitely navigate through ethical uh, dilemmas and staffing. So staffing, if you do this for one year, for anybody that has ever done what I do, one year is like a dog, it's like dog years, you know, it feels like seven, you know, because you go through so, so much. And uh, so there's been many times where uh, a candidate won't get the job for a certain reason. And uh, I could go two routes. I could either be honest with them or I could just tell them a little lie and they keep keep doing what they're doing. And what I try to do always is I, I try to be very honest with them and I'll tell them exactly what they did wrong or what they said in the interview that didn't allow them to, to, to get the position. So, I mean, there's just so many obstacles. Look, I'll give you an example. The latest one was a candidate didn't uh, get an offer because the employer saw their, her Instagram and her Instagram was way too 
out there for their taste. And um, that was maybe a situation where I could have dialed it back, but I actually called her. I told her the truth. And, and then she started talking about maybe suing the company. And I was like, whoa, whoa, that's not. You know, so maybe on that one, I should have said, hey, they just they went with somebody else and called it a day, you know, um, but I, I always try to pursue truth. Uh, you know, I, I think I had mentioned to you before in previous conversations, sure. I'm a Christian and I'm not perfect, but I'm trying to be as Christ like as possible. So but maybe sometimes that see that would that would have bit me in the ass big time. I, I actually ended up massaging that. But uh, I, I just try to be honest as much as possible through obstacles, because I've noticed that if I go the other route, just it's a snowball effect and it's horrible it ends up really bad for me you know mm -hmm. oh yeah i don't believe god blesses lies one bit a hundred percent he detests <laughs> it i mean you read the bible he does not like that at all he <laughs> feels like it's a foolish thing if you read proverbs so you know you you want to make sure you're as steadfast as possible and you have humility and honesty yeah, see this is another unplanned question but <laughs> i feel like i need to ask um sure. you know my passion for the underserved is because i'm was well, I, I mean, I don't know if I'm still technically a part of it, um, but my heart has been there because I also, and I, one of the areas is because one, I've battled mental illness my whole yeah. life. Um, I have disassociative identity disorder, even though I'm like healing, like in miraculous ways from it and being evaluated for ASD. But then I developed the, the tremor, right? And, and that has took a lot from me. But one of the most frustrating things for me when I was looking for a job, like when I get impatient with the path, the the with the journey, and I mm. because God, I mean, I, I I know in my heart what God created me to do, and I've been all in. But there's been times I get nervous and I want to bail out and go, oh, I'm scared. <laughs> but when I have to apply for jobs, I have to put that I'm disabled because mm. I've got the conditions that are listed, and and I have to put that on there and. It has been, I've had a, on a few occasions, somebody reach out and ask, you know, like, well, what's the disability? And I tell them and then I'd freak out and like, no, no, we don't want to deal with that. Um, but in the future, like where we're going and going back to AI, like part of this beauty of the fourth industrial revolution is accessibility, inclusivity, the disabled, they're all yes. going to have an opportunity because of these tools that they will mm -hmm. be able to do things they could not do before and can do things that they could not do before. How do you see executive recruitment, employment working for the underserved communities, people that have been disabled, that may have to write that they've got a mental illness or they're a quadriplegic or you know whatever it may be, but they're really qualified for the role. Yeah. Do you think there'll ever be a shift or a change in executive recruitment that opens pathways for the underserved or the disabled? It's a good question. The last two years, I've definitely seen an increase, at least in my agency, of placing people that are disabled or don't have some certain capacity. And that is due to the fact that there are just better business tools out there as well that will allow that to happen. So um, where I didn't place anybody before, just through what, for whatever reason, uh, the last couple of years, I definitely have seen a shift in the mindset for various different employers to be more open to that. Also, and also, I want to make sure that 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 I also mention it's hard to find quality people now that's been that way since COVID. So anybody that has a brain and is willing to really work, it doesn't matter if you're disabled anymore, they're willing to give you a shot. Uh, for that reason, because it's all about passion. And I think companies are starting to see you, you either have it or you don't. You're either motivated or you're not a motivated person. And that's pretty much it. And it and it seems like it's getting harder and harder in this society to find motivated people. As you mentioned before, too, there's a lot of distractions. You know, there's all these distractions now that actually can become anchors um, as well. But I have seen an increase in, in terms of, of uh, finding and, and hiring disabled uh, uh, professionals uh, to some capacity. But uh, I'm, I definitely feel that there will be an increase of that in the very near future. I also think that veterans as well, too, there's been a lot, an uptick of hiring uh, veterans as well. Uh, yeah. There used to be a stigma sometimes of not hiring people that came back from war due to trauma and personality disorders and all that stuff. But I am seeing much more openness with that as well. And that, you know, even though I didn't serve, I, I, I love this country so much. And that means a lot to me, you know, to, to see that as well.
for sure. I, I, if I was hiring a bunch of people, I would ask them, do you have ASD? And they, they said, yes, or you're hired. Like, <laughs> I mean, cause it's, a, I mean, really ASD, it can be a supernatural gift if given the right environment. Like if you're yes. willing to work around the quirks, like even with me with disassociations and, and and if it ends up being the actual ASD diagnosis, it doesn't matter to me at this point. Like I've, I've lived with it my whole life. I know how to thrive with it. And I also know where the superpower in it lies, but I also know my limitations. And I'm willing always to be upfront with that. And even with the people that I, my clients now that I work with, they choose to work with me because they know my gifts. They also know that there's also boundaries set up because to work with me in a very high level way, in a productive way, there's boundaries. There has to be. The boundaries are for, for me, the boundaries are for you. But yeah. at the same time, you can get more out of me than you can most people if you're willing to work with me under in that respect. And I would give other people the same respect. And so what I think, and I could be wrong, but like we got to start having these conversations because I think at this point, especially after the last four years, we're all a little mentally ill. We all have some PTSD. So like we need to have yeah. these, we need to have these conversations because we might realize that, wait a second, this person I normally wouldn't want to work with actually could be the greatest blessing in my business ever. So Agreed. anyway, I thank you for answering that question. Of course. All right. Next question. What leadership lesson took you the longest to learn and why has it been so impactful for you? You know, that's a good question. I, uh, so in my, so my, when I started my business with my business partner, it was much more of a lifestyle business. I just wanted to make X amount of money and go mountain biking and get in shape and sweat <laughs> all day, you know, and I, and we did that for a couple of years. And, and then, you know, I, I was, I'm younger, I'm 20 years younger than my business partner. So I told him, Hey, I want to scale up. I want to keep on growing. And we now have employees. So my biggest challenge for us from a leadership perspective has been from turning into a production sales sales professional in my business to now transitioning over to being a CEO, which has been the hardest transition because as a CEO, now it's not just managing employees and handling their their whatever their emotions or whatever they got going on business wise. Um, and then also just transitioning over to, you know, being much more forward thinking when it comes to operations, systems, AI, and implementing things that are going to be set up for now and the future as well as we keep growing as an organization. But I've had the biggest struggle and the biggest challenge going from a production guy that brought in X amount of revenue, one of the best ones, to now you know, being less that and being more of the CEO and replicating and duplicating myself. So I've had to really uh, hone down on my leadership skills. And a lot of it has been through books from Marcus Aurelius, John Maxwell, the Bible, the Bible, you know, Proverbs teaches you how to be a man, how to be a leader um, as well, you know, and, and not, not, and, you know, wise men seek counsel while the fool goes on his own, they say. So, mm -hmm. Uh, I had to seek counsel just from friends that are CEOs as well that have upscaled their businesses and 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 taking all that advice in, I've been able to apply certain things that have allowed, and I'm still growing. I'm not saying I'm perfect. I'm still always developing and, and, and growing as a CEO and as a leader, but I wouldn't, I would be lying if I tell you I didn't have a tough time or a challenge transitioning over my mind from, from production to now being a CEO of a company. No, I totally get that. That's a good answer. Thank you. Okay. We kind of talked about this a little bit, but I really want to hear your perspective on it. How do you envision the future of work and how is HR exchange preparing for those changes? Great question. So there's two key things that I've noticed uh, in the economy uh, and, and what's changing and, and the behavior that businesses are engaging in now. So I don't know. I, I, I think we're going to have a very interesting future when it comes to employment. There's two things that I that I definitely see. One of them is uh, RPO and, and that's basically recruitment, offshoring. And what's happening is because after COVID, there's less and less people wanting to work here in the U.S. A lot of emerging markets like Colombia, Mexico, the Philippines, my goodness, the Filipinos work hard yes, they and, do. Other, and, and other emerging markets as well, too. 
have prepared these these students coming out of college to speak English very well. They have the attitude, they have the drive, and guess what? They're they're seventy five to ninety percent cheaper than the American counterparts. So right now, uh, offshore recruitment is a five point two billion dollar industry. In the next five years, it's going to go to ten point six billion. That means it's going to double. That means more companies, which I'm seeing it already, are hiring outside of the U S. So now, if you're a kid coming out of college, you're now not just competing with your counterparts. You're also competing with that kid in the Philippines or Colombia or Mexico. And let me tell you, you speak with these people. They speak better English than a lot. Of, I'm here in Miami. They speak better English than a lot of people that live here and grow up and grew up here as well, right? So, yeah. So th that's one thing. And then the other thing too, to your point, to what you were trying to say, what's happening with AI and systems? Um, it's uh, companies are starting to realize we, they're trying to find ways where they could rely less on human capital and more on systems and automation as well. So. The last two years, I've seen a new uh, position being filled consistently, and that is corporate project manager. These project managers will audit your business and then find ways to implement systems and streamline them and also reduce cost as well, too. Uh, and, and so I see a lot of companies all across the board from manufacturing to real estate to um, you know, biotech. Everybody's finding ways to scale down as opposed to scaling up when it comes to human capital. So I've been doing this 12 years. When I first started dealing with marketing and human resource uh, departments, they were bigger. Do you remember that? Do you remember HR departments? There oh, were yeah. eight, 10, 12 people, marketing, same thing too, accounting. Guess what? Today, it's a, an HR department, a typical HR department in a small to mid-sized company. It's one person, two or three if you're lucky. Uh, and even in the bigger companies that are shared service, it's it's not 12 people anymore. It's just three or four HR people and two uh, and marketing people as well. So everything, every single year, if you've noticed or if people start noticing, it's dwindling more and more and more. And, and I could see that being the case. So I'm not trying to paint a bleak future. I guess what I'm trying to tell people, whoever does listen to this, and, it, and you're in the employment market or, or you're working for somebody else, find new skills. As you were saying earlier, don't just focus on one thing. Find new skills to prepare yourself for whatever may come your way in the future, whether it's a layoff or a new industry emerging. I mean, crypto emerged the last couple of years, and that's a big thing. Um, and there's going to be other positions that are going to start emerging. I work with an influencer right now, 24 years old, revenues 4.5 million in her business. And, uh, and and another position that I've seen is now brand strategist, brand manager. I have one as well, too. And these yeah. people basically handle all your marketing, all your social media. But that's a new position that came out the last couple of years that maybe 10, 12 years ago might have not been a, a very common thing unless you were a celebrity or something like that. And even then you had a PR firm. Well, these PR firms are now just one individual or two people now. So it's it's getting very, very specific and streamlined everywhere, all across the board. I, oh, I it's love interesting. I I love that you talked about this because the other thing that happened that a lot of people I don't think really thought much about, but when Fiverr and websites like that came uh -huh. out, uh -huh. okay, I kid you not, I've been watching this for a while because I had this prediction internally, but saying it out loud was never going to do any good. But <laughs> I'm, I was looking at all of the things that they were doing skill-wise, and they're all things that I taught myself to do because to be a media organization i needed to know how to do all of those things yeah and mind you back then it was way harder to do now with ai simplifies it but when americans and other people from around the world but a lot of americans i think americans fed fiverr more than anyone and then the people that are on fiverr in bangladesh and in the middle east they're all over the world third world countries this whole time we've been training them and teaching them, or they've been honing their skills, mastering these skills that now have put them in position where they have the knowledge and the skill set to be their own media organizations. I've seen more people that used to help me with podcasts and editing before I learned how to do it that are now operating as their own media companies in different parts of Africa and Asia wow. and all over the world. I'm going, oh my gosh, that really happened. And so to your point about the skills that need to be learned, like these things that we were passing off to other people, y'all need to be learning how to do it yourself now. Yes, yes. It, 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 it's so important. So I love that you said that. Good um, point. All right, next question. I think you'll enjoy this one. <laughs> what emerging trend in recruitment 
excite you the most and why? Honestly, getting back to AI, it's 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 exciting. It's exciting because it's making my business a little bit easier and more finite and more streamlined in so many ways. So I am enjoying that part. I'm actually also enjoying recruiting uh in other markets outside of the us i just played somebody in canada so because of my systems and because i've perfected and streamlined my systems i'm able to now focus uh in other emerging markets as well too from a recruitment perspective so um i'm even in that remember i told you uh you know rpo being a offshore recruiting being a 5.2 mm -hmm. billion dollar industry going into 10.6 well i'm going to be part of that as well too uh, part of that trend you kind of have to be these days um uh, it's it's the only way i mean it's much more affordable and as you get quality talent as well too for certain things right um so mm -hmm. i'm very excited about that uh factor as well you know it's going to be a nice mix it's it's a very i don't know i wish i could predict the future it, it's definitely i don't know if it's scary uncertain but it's like you said it's it's i'm learning all these tools now myself so then i can prepare for them so but that the technology part gets me excited because technology keeps out rapidly growing at a faster rate it seems like wait until chat gpt wait until five years from now how what it's going to do you know if it's doing what it's doing right now wait until it learns everything it's learning in the next five years it's it's going to be crazier the kind of cars that are be, are going to be coming out you know with the ai that they have so it, it's it's very exciting i think not just for my industry but i think all across the board uh there's a lot of exciting things that are gonna just make things more accessible and just and more easy to do at the same time i know that there's a con you mentioned it earlier before but there's a lot of positives uh, in my opinion oh, sure uh on, on that realm well i think there's gonna be an equalizing that takes place i mean like one of the I work a lot and not I haven't been to Africa yet. I'm going uh next month, but nice. These the 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 communities that I'm working with throughout Africa, these ecosystems, the one thing I've learned, they don't have the infrastructure yet. They don't have laptops. Like they they do most things on their phone, but wow. they don't have the infrastructure for the really great internet throughout the the continent yet. Um but it doesn't stop them from learning all of the skills that are going to be required for the world that we're going into so to almost be like a a light switch for people in central america and through asia and africa and other parts of the world that have normally have been kind of left behind or forgotten or like oh they've got nothing going on they literally have been training and preparing for what's coming because all of the investment money that i've seen mm -hmm. floating around is pouring into entrepreneurship programs in africa in other wow. countries that have normally again considered third world so they're learning all the skills they're learning all the how-tos they have the knowledge and as soon as they get the infrastructure it's game over and so like well I'm, I'm sitting here going do i really even want to be in america like i love yeah. growing up here but it's about to change here yeah like, yeah so i mean like god i'll go anywhere you want me to go <laughs> Like if you want to send me to Africa or Central America, hey, I'm all for it. But you know, I to your point, I think most of the opportunities, heck, I even know there's people in China and other parts of the world that they're looking to Americans to recruit to start pulling yeah. over there. Yeah. Because yeah. Yeah. we have yeah. certain skills that are needed, but not everybody. And not everyone's gonna get chosen. It's such an interesting yeah. time. I love that it you is. brought that up. It is. It is. It's it's uncertain times for sure, but I'm I'm keeping a positive attitude. <laughs> God works out everything for the good that that loves Him. Yeah, I get, Amen. <laughs> I believe that. All right. What's the biggest misconception about AI in recruitment, and how are you working to change that perception? Uh, what I've seen is that uh, sometimes people think that we're like a chat box or that we're uh, that we're AI uh, itself. So for anybody that's currently using an agency or anything like that, uh, you know, the AI probably has the capacity, but you'll tell right away that it's very fake. So don't believe that. Um, so that's that's pretty much it. I mean, AI is still because I'm part of a group called the Vices Group, and it's all these CEOs in the staffing industry. We meet in Chicago and other places as well, too. And we're all, it's a still, it's still very much a new concept, just like it is for everybody. Come on, think about it. Two years ago, we weren't hearing about AI or during COVID. AI was not really 
uh, thing we were talking or key word we were mentioning all uh, consistently. Now it just feels like it's it's running our lives in, in certain ways. So uh, what I've noticed is a lot of the staffing companies that are way bigger than me as well, they're just getting into AI right now uh, as well. You know what I've seen in the market though, uh, from an AI and just systems perspective, the bigger companies are too addicted. You ever heard of the same, they're, you're addicted to oil, meaning you're doing the same, replicating the same business process that you had maybe 20, 30, 40 years ago that works, obviously. The bigger companies are getting left behind, just stuck doing that same old process. And the newer, smaller to mid-sized companies are kicking ass and taking names and really implementing systems and scaling up like a rocket ship. And you see that in the market as well, very easily. So there's certain, there's big companies that I do not want to mention that are very well known that I've worked with in the past that I, I know for a fact that they don't change. Oh man, you're not going to hear about them or you're going to hear about a new competitor overtaking that company. And you're going to see more of that probably in the next four, five, 10 years. Absolutely. Um, but yeah, that's what I've seen in the market mainly. I love that you said that because you're spot on. And, and, and where we're going to really see it too, is in entertainment and, yeah. and film, movies, artists, musicians, even painters and sculptors. Like they're the this world that we're heading into is set up and favors them. It's I'm, I mean, again, I I see the potential problems. I absolutely do, but I yeah. also see so many blessings that that can come out of all of this, and and I believe that will. Great yeah, answer. So too. All right. Next question: What book or resource? has had the most profound impact on your professional development? Uh, there's uh, two that I've recently read the la this past year that have really, um, you know, the typical answer I would say is the Bible, and that's one of them. But the, the two that I want to focus on is uh, Unreasonable Hospitality by Will Gadara. Have you ever read that book before? I've heard about it. I've not read it, but it, I what I've heard has oh, been quite amazing. It's life changing, and I love how he writes and and you know because he pu he puts personal touches into the story as well too. But unreasonable hospitality is about being unreasonably different than your competitors and and what to do to create a special uh, moment in business for your clients or customers. He ran Eleven One uh, Park, which is, is is one of the best restaurants in New York. And, you know, I think that restaurant you need to advance. I think you need to book it two to three months in advance just to even get a table. And uh, the reason for that being is, is just he did a lot of unreasonable things that would create an experience for 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 his customers in that restaurant and in everything that he did anything from as little as to writing notes you know writing notes after a meeting and sending a note over or you know just just beautiful special things remember us human beings we all have emotions we're made of emotions and what unreasonable hospitality teaches you is how to tap into those emotions uh, for that c consumer or customer, so they keep on coming back, and it's creating an experience. So that book for whoever, no matter what industry you're in, that's a great book. The other one is Blue Ocean Strategy, which is a compile of case studies of Harvard Review, um, a ha Harvard Review of uh, or audited of companies, right? Of what they were able to do uh, from at the NYPD to Apple. And it's just what, so a red ocean is when you are, let's just say in staffing, I'm doing exactly the same thing other staffing agencies are doing. I'm not doing anything different. A blue ocean, it's creating a segment within staffing that nobody else is doing. And, and I'm creating my own blue ocean, my own path, and there's less competition and I'm able to control my environment a little bit better because of it. And so that's a great book that also was very uh, impactful as well to me is in, in the in the past year. Wait, I who wrote that book? Uh, I forget I the author's the name. Right all speak at CI, I, I think I saw him speak at CI Live. Uh, uh, his name is uh, Rene uh, Rene Malberg and then uh, uh, Chan Kim. It, it's two people that put it together, but it's it's basically um, Harvard Review st case studies that they basically consolidate and then they add a little bit more synopsis into it as oh. well too. If you haven't read that book. I highly, highly recommend it. I buy it for people all the time when I, that I'm mentoring or whatnot. I always buy that book for them, especially that it's ones that I see that are either entrepreneurs or have the potential to become an entrepreneur. See, that's 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 where I like to serve a lot. Is I like to make people believe in themselves, and uh, 
I've been able to do that already for a couple uh, individuals and it makes me so happy, you know, and if they do, and if they do better than, like my girlfriend, for instance, if her design company does 10 X more than my company, I would be the happiest boy. You know, let me tell you, you know what I mean? So it, it would be a blessing, you know? I love that. I love that. Yes. And I get to interview your girlfriend. I'm pretty yes. excited about that. Oh, I'm very yeah. excited. I'm so excited as well, too, uh, for that. I'll probably watch that one way more than this one, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is actually a nice segue because uh, this does probably tie into your girlfriend a little bit here. But how do you maintain work-life balance in a demanding role? And what advice would you give to others? Do not make your business as an entrepreneur your God. Um, I realized my relationship with her and other relationships with my mom and people that I love uh, really were very much affected because I would always put HR exchange and I would put business first. And unfortunately, that that created an ego and it made me neglect a lot of the people that I love. Um, so my biggest advice is don't, don't, don't treat your business as if it's the be all one-stop shop or anything like that. I've learned that everything in this life is temporary and mm -hmm. I will pass one day. And, uh, I want to be able to cherish the moments with my loved ones, which are way more important than my business. So I've created a different ideology now or a practice, you know, I've been going through therapy and everything else, but I've learned now to appreciate live in the moment and really appreciate whoever it is that I'm with, whether it's my mom, my girlfriend, my father, I know they will pass one day. I don't know if I'll ever see them again. Nothing's guaranteed. So I really just, even this conversation, I'm, I'm taking you in, man. I cherish you. You know, I, I love your energy. I feel it. Even though we're digital and we're virtual, uh, I, I, I just, I enjoy the moment. I live in the moment now. My business is secondary always to the people that I love. And uh, that includes God. I even neglected God. I even neglected him as well, too. Mm -hmm. That's the mighty, the guy that created the world and I neglected him. So I can't do that again. So I, I have a different mindset now. And you know what? I'm being blessed for it. And, and, and my relationship with the people I love has gained strength as opposed to weaken. And they, they were they were very weak before. And I, I would allow things to happen because of that. I would always put my business first. And now I've learned not to do that. I, I'm as guilty as, of that as anybody. And even, <laughs> even after giving my life to the Lord years ago, I allowed a relationship to become more important. I allowed that to get in the way. Quit putting God first, mm. everything just, Everything that, everything that was put before God eroded, like yeah. and crumbled, and it was a very powerful. It's been a very powerful lesson to learn, and like I got it through my head of how important that is because I wouldn't be here, like I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't be alive. Like yeah. clearly, God has a God has a plan for me because I'm still here, breathing, and given an opportunity every day to pursue my dreams. That in itself is a miracle. But at the same time, if I don't honor God by keeping him first, can I really say I love God? Yeah, and I don't know yeah, if I, right. I don't know if I can. Good and point. so because of that, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a tough adjustment. I mean, it really, it is hard to anyone to go, oh, it's so easy to put God first place in all your life. I go, really? Cause let's take an inventory because I bet there's a lot of things that we put before God and we're, we're not even cognitive of it. Mm-hmm. So I yeah. really, really love your answer. I like that we have synergy and you're in a, you know, we have similar experiences. I like it. <laughs> yeah, me too. Next question. If you could go back in time and give your younger self one piece of career advice, what would it be? Don't stress, enjoy the process, you know, don't stress. Don't be too hard on yourself. I, uh, because I told you how I grew up. Yeah. I was always very hard on myself. I used to self, I uh, self deprecation. I used to talk very negatively about myself and, uh, you know, I, I would, uh, yeah, if I didn't meet a certain goal or anything like that, I didn't give myself enough grace. And if I can go back and tell my younger self, anything is like chill, relax, enjoy the process. You know, you're going to, you're going to be fine. Just keep developing. Don't let failure stop you or anything like that. You know, enjoy it, enjoy it, enjoy every bit of it. If you can, you know? 
So that would be my biggest advice. And to anybody that's hard on themselves or suffers from mental health issues, as you mentioned that you, you have confessed that you did, so did I, man. We, I think we all, especially after COVID, have a little bit of mental health or social media and all that other stuff. And uh, yeah, never talk bad about yourself or you know, be self-deprecate. Love yourself, you know? Love yourself. That way you allow others to love you as well. How could, you, how could others love you when you can't love yourself, you know? So... Um, that would be my biggest advice to to my younger self. I wish I would have known that earlier in life. Did you ever talk poorly about yourself in front of other people to try to fit in? Yeah, yeah, of course, of course. So I grew up in a in a broken home. Uh, so that whatever I saw internally translated externally in school and everything else. But actually, I I, I, I still didn't fit in. I would get bullied and things like that. You know what I mean? Uh, because yeah. kids, you know, they take advantage of all that stuff. But uh, yeah, yeah. So I, I went through my own duration of mental health issues from, you know, childhood all the way through adulthood that I'm still working with, with a therapist and, and continuing to, I think, mental health it's it's like going to the gym you know you want to always exercise your mind and 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 really re you know exercise and, and and go through through that and, and don't don't neglect it because it's it's like it's like going to the gym you you know you have to keep your body up to date you have to keep your mind as healthy as possible and i i very much believe in therapy you let it all out and my therapist is amazing she gives me exercises to rewire my brain from traumas from childhood and it's been man i didn't think these things would work but boy do they work and it's been a blessing i'm 45 years old and i finally for the first time in my life found a therapist i like yeah right? one i don't want to manip one i don't want to manipulate yeah because I, I don't even know what that's about. Like, why would anyone go to therapy <laughs> to manipulate the therapist? But I did it, especially in couples counseling. Because I, I mean, like, oh, goodness. But, you know, I'm over that. And I'm working with a therapist now that is just blowing my mind. Like, and I'm so grateful because I'm now finally able to accept myself, like, and love myself. And not in a narcissistic way, but like make loving choices for myself and like want like to do good things for myself yes. as opposed to, you know, putting myself in, I think like one of the things that I used to do is I would put myself in harm's way to try to benefit someone else. But the reason was to get into their favor. So like I would uh, hurt myself to try to establish a connection as screwed up as that may sound. And I get oh, no, a million of relate. examples, but I that that in itself is like how awful. Like, why would I do that? Yeah. And I've started to come to this realization here recently because of the therapy that I've been doing that, and it takes me, it, or or it, 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 if anything will knock me off course, it's that because I always feel disgusted afterwards i feel dirty like why would i do that just to <laughs> feel connected it's awful but yeah yeah no listen i can relate i you know what i was thinking about when you said that quick little story and back in high school i was very much i'm an extrovert now as an adult <laughs> but i was such an introvert as a young kid teenage and even young adult so back in high school i, lo I love i used to like this girl a lot you know i had like the biggest crush and uh Instead of trying to connect with her, I was able to c connect her to a buddy of mine and then they ended up dating. And I'm like, why did I do that? You know what I mean? Why did <laughs> I do that? And I felt disgusted with myself. So trust me, I, I, I understand where you're coming from. <laughs> Thank you for being vulnerable. <laughs> <laughs> Very vulnerable. But you see, you bring that, that side out of me, man. You know, it's, uh, we have good synergy. Next question. Can you share a story of a particularly challenging placement that resulted in unexpected success? A challenging placement that, um, that, that it resulted in an ex unexpected success. That's a very good one. Cause I do feel that a lot of them are challenging since co post COVID, you know? <laughs> so, um, I'll, I'll tell you one that, that, uh, I'm trying to think here. Um, okay. I, one recent one is I work with an insurance company that's transitioning over from being a LATAM, Latin American company, meaning they are in Latin American markets that are very saturated and transitioning over to much more of a corporate global entity. And um, I, I, I had a person, the perfect person was based out of New York. 
And it was so hard to get her from moving to New York to South Florida. He didn't want to do it at first. And then the company wasn't paying the salary that she was asking for. So there was a huge disconnect. So things started off very rocky. Um, some way, somehow, with me and my business partner, we were able to convince her. We brought her down with our own dime. She was able to take the position. And uh, what started out pretty bad now has turned out to flourish because not only does she like the company, but because of that, we're getting a lot more business now from that organization as well, too. So it what I thought was like not going to be what, what I thought was not going to be a fruitful journey in the long term turns out that it was quite the opposite, you know? So with C-level positions, there's a lot of challenges involved because there's a lot of relocations that are involved as well too. There's a, the, these interview processes tend to be more rigorous for CEO, CFO. You're looking at five to six different interviews with various different uh, uh, people. So what ends up happening sometimes in staffing, especially for those kind of roles is, you don't send four to five candidates, you know, if you're lucky, you have two or three, you know, but lucky if you have two. And the problem is that that CEO or CFO that is going through the interview process will pass the first four or five interviews, but maybe the sixth guy did not like them. And that's all it takes to drop them completely. Um, so it sucks it, it, from that perspective. So that's what I was trying to tell you, like, man, I'm trying to think what an, what's a good example, because I feel like all placements are very challenging from that perspective. And, and, you don't have that many people with that kind of talent or niche, especially at the sea level. You know, you either have it or you don't, and you can't really replicate it if you come from another industry sometimes. That's really good. <laughs> huh. I hope so. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I won't add anything. Uh, how do you build and maintain trust with clients in an industry? often perceived as transactional by not being transactional by going the extra <laughs> by going the extra mile you know uh, i'll give you an example a lot of recruiters i've learned what they do is they'll just take a resume they'll throw it and and they'll 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 say uh joshua uh, yeah go to this company at 2 p.m tomorrow good luck i don't do that i prepare you i get to know my client i get to know their culture i get to know their values because it's for me one of the things my girlfriend is telling me to write a book and i think i should and and the title should be uh job interviews are like are like dates they really are you have to prepare for them you have to ask open-ended questions you have to be engaging you have to be a good storyteller as well too so what i do is i prepare my candidates i i find out everything i can about the company do the values and uh, do the values align so i won't send a candidate if they have no matter how good their technical skills are but if they don't have the mindset if they don't have the mindset that the company has then it's not me worth not sending them and wasting my client's time or wasting the candidate's time so i look at it like a like a like a date like a matching and seeing if the values the foundation the personalities match and then the technical skills as well too so i go the extra mile by not being transactional by asking values are you are, are you micro are you macro what kind of leadership skills do you currently have in your company what kind of culture are you trying to build here and then you know i try to uh, have you ever heard of pi personality index assessments mm -hmm. so i i actually use those a lot as well too for a lot of my clients as well and i tell and i give any any company that's hearing this implement that into your business because it's data it's data and it's it tends to be very good data as accurate as it can be you know us human beings were complex but it gives you a really good idea of who the person is and don't do it prior to meeting with them meet with them first then have them take the pi that way you have a really nice assessment because i had a client say oh man i thought this person was one way but after i read it it all made sense and i recalibrated you know of who this person is right so I think that's that's very very uh important so it's not being transactional it's being a human being it's being unreasonable that's why i like that book unreasonable hospitality it's being unreasonable in your ways that are going to create a certain emotion and experience because we all look for experiences we even pay top dollar for experiences right and this a service industry like mine is it's no different from going to a hotel or or renting a yacht you know and get or going to a restaurant it's service at the end of the day i realize that i make the connection so you always want to be as hospitable as possible respectful have humility and be honest as well too it's what i've learned beautiful beautiful what's one audacious goal 
you have for HR exchange over the next five years? To scale up to have an EBITDA at least of uh, 3.5 million, uh, I think we're we're on our way there. You know, so 3.5 million is having a revenue of nine to 10 million. Like I said, we're on our way there. So that would be my biggest goal. But for me, it's not to become richer or anything like that is, but it's it, it, one of the things that I like about you is I like to serve others as well too. And since I come from a broken home, I'd love to invest in, in either an organization like Safe at Home. Joe Torrey has this great organization called Safe at Home, where his story, I relate a lot to everything and, and a lot of the kids that go through those programs. It's, it's, I feel like it's me. So it's either investing in that or creating my own organization focuses a lot on broken home kids that uh, have come from broken home or or moms as well or women that have been affected by domestic abuse and and going through experiences like that because I saw my mom she's such a warrior but um, I saw my mom go through certain things that I would never like to see any human being go through them uh, so for me th those things are important uh, and and that that would be very nice if God blesses me to hit those goals I definitely would pay it back uh, as well because it's I feel like I don't deserve it. You know what I mean? But it, it's, it's his blessing. So it, it, it would, it would be an honor. Beautiful. <clears throat> how, how do you hope to leave a lasting impact on the recruitment industry and the broader business world? Uh, making people realize two things that I talked about already is it's, it's my girlfriend has encouraged me and I think I'm just going to do it as I want to write a book and I want people to see recruitment or or just employees and employer connections like any other relationship whether it's friendship whether it's uh you know boyfriend girlfriend husband wife you have to look at it that way you have to take it as serious you have when you sign an offer letter think of it as marriage it's that important it's that big of a deal in my opinion this job impacts you it it kind of defines you a little bit too as well people get defined sometimes for the professions that they do hey my name is so-and-so I'm, I'm a lawyer you know or whatever <laughs> you know so people people take take stake into their uh, into their professional realms right and 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 I, I think it's important that we start looking at it take away the business side of it and, and and look at it more as a person you're dealing with another human being that's imperfect and you're trying to prove yourself to them and sell yourself to them so i think that that to me is very important so one of the things that i want to do of value is is write a book um as well for people to change their mindsets a little bit more because there's so many people my girlfriend was telling me that she meets so many people that say i'm so nervous or and it's because they're taking the wrong approach so i want people to realize that staffing is it's it's a people business and it's all about connections and and it's not just connections but it's genuine connections because that's how i get paid by placing making genuine placements that are honest not only on the technical side but they're honest both parties are in agreement in terms of mindset perfect last question oh my gosh <laughs> Like some of these go by way, way too fast. I'm like, oh, we can do this for another hour, can't we? All <laughs> right, last question. Yes. If you were not in recruitment, what alternative career would you choose? I would have chosen working in, in anything related to Formula One. I, I am a racing fanatic and passion i have a tattoo my, my biggest i know you're not supposed to have idols but like the biggest guy i grew up watching i don't know if you if you were into f1 back in the day uh it's a brazilian guy named Ayrton senna and he means so much to me even to this day as well he's like the father that i never had um so i wish as an adult i would have uh maybe even back then started a podcast of one of the first ones to start a podcast on f1 because i know everything about f1 you ask me any question i know the answer so i wish i was involved in, within that sport because i have such passion for it uh as well so i i if i had another life i i would focus on either being a racing driver if that if, if possible because i thought <laughs> i had the skill set you know that'd be great or a mechanic or or even a broadcaster or being involved within the sport because it gets me really excited it wouldn't feel although what i i love what i do now and it doesn't feel like work much of the time that for sure would not feel like work at all which just be like <laughs> a blessing to 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 be part of that on a daily basis i love that that that's actually why i got into media to allow me to whatever i felt like doing that day i could do from a creative standpoint but yeah. to answer your question i enjoy f1 more than nascar but the biggest reason is the scene 
I love the international stage. Right. Like, yeah. When, when I think of F1, I think of Monaco, and you know, I mean, like it, it, the the whole scene, the vibe around that style of racing to me is way more attractive than NASCAR. Although NASCAR races are a blast to go to. Oh, they're awesome. They're oh. awesome. I mean, and they're so fast in person. They're great on TV, not so much, but in person, you just see these things, and it's like, man, there's a human being in that box. I actually got to drive a NASCAR car in Homestead Speedway. Uh, my leg was shaking, you know, because you feel the vibration of the of, of the car. It's a very interesting drive. If you've never done it, do the Andretti experience down in Daytona and or Homestead. If you ever come down to Florida, you can either drive a NASCAR car or an Indy car. I drove an Indy car. I went all the way up to 186 miles per hour, and I loved every minute of it, you know. Oh, so so I, urge, I urge you to do that if you can. I, I think I would do that. I, I'm my days of. I would still jump out of an airplane. I would do that again. Ooh. Uh, I no more cliff diving for me though. That I, <laughs> that I I used to be a cliff diver. Like fuck, give me the biggest cliff. When I lived in Hawaii and traveling to Costa Rica, like oh that's scary. I love the hike and then jumping off the tallest cliff I could find. But those days are over for me. I'm done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Even me, I'm a mountain biker, and I try to not to do too much crazy things anymore because I'm I'm seven you know and i'm like I, if i get injured i have consequences now you know what i mean yeah it hurts so, I, yeah. and i i wrecked i raced mountain bikes for a little bit i wasn't good but i'm competitive and so i'm like if i'm gonna do this i'm gonna compete that's yeah. an expensive sport <laughs> yes it is you break your bike oh my gosh yeah. That's but it's like so good fun. for the brain. It's so good for the brain. You have to be reactive and think quick, and that keeps me sharp and focused, man. So I, 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 I thank the Lord that they he introduced me to this years ago. I actually learned it during the pandemic. Crazy enough. Oh, nice. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Well, this has been amazing. Uh, I had so much fun, and uh, what I'd like hey. to do is give you the opportunity to have the last word. You can plug anything you want to plug. Uh, but also anything on your heart you want to share, even if it's not even related to what we talked about. Yeah. Share. The floor is yours. Well, the one thing I will say, remember I mentioned this F1 idol that I have, Ayrton Senna. One of the things that really impacted my life was seeing a video of him. And I, I want to kind of tell people what the quote is. And that is, wherever you are in life, whether you're at your highest or your lowest, whether you're rich or poor, if you focus on one thing and you have determination and a strong faith in God, some way, somehow you're going to make it. Doesn't matter how, but you're going to make it in life, no matter what you put your mind into. If you have strong faith in the Lord, one of the things that I love about him is every time he would win a race, he would he would always say, it's not my victory. It's his. It's his victory. He gave me the victory. So it's being, it's putting God first. You know, I've, I've learned that. It took me a while to learn that. Unfortunately, I wish I would have learned it when I was younger, but put God first in everything that you do. And you'll see that even when you fail, you're going to see grace and beauty from it as well. You're going to be able to look at life and, and whatever negative you have, you could always turn it. You could always see that you can turn that into a positive for his grace, his benefit and yours as well too. And, and having that understanding has been such a blessing uh so that would be my last word outside of that if there's anybody that uh would like to work with me i'm here for you um uh we're growing as a company we're in various different markets we deal with a lot of private equity um a lot of high level uh, uh clients ultra high net worth individuals as well too so it'll be a blessing to work with you and collaborate and uh joshua when you come down to florida i, I have to give you the biggest hug and uh we're gonna have to do lunch or dinner absolutely